so again, I'd like to welcome our speakers for this evening. Michael, uh, excuse me, Dr. Michael Radin, an associate professor of um, biological science at Lehigh University with a research interest in neural development, um, working with Nidarians. And Dr. Layden, if you'd like to begin, and there you go, you've got it, share your screen. All right, so can you guys see my cursor? That's the important part. Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. And I might have to move you guys around while I do this. Well, thanks Molly and Kim for inviting me to um, speak to the teachers and be part of this event. Um, I'm pretty uh, avid uh, person trying to incorporate people into STEM uh, fields and Lehigh has a number of programs uh, that I'd like to make people aware of. There's something called the RARE program, which is rapid accelerated research experience that's um, sort of targets underrepresented groups in STEM. Um, and if you get accepted into that, you could actually essentially get a free ride to Lehigh. So it's a, a mechanism for people who um, normally wouldn't have access to a number of universities for financial reasons or other things to get exposed to research. Um, and we also have a BioConnect program where we try to bring students from uh, community colleges into the lab in the summer. Of course, most of this has been on hold except for the RARE program because that's an actual four-year undergraduate program. But um, just have that on teachers' radars when you're looking to guide students to potential places to go. So I wanna talk a little bit about my path to investigating neural development and regeneration in um, this sea anemone nematostella vectensis. And, you know, why you would want to pick a weird animal like a sea anemone to look at this is not obvious at first glance, but hopefully it will be by the end of this. Um, and really, I think as STEM educators, we are in a really cool time that makes trying to get people excited about this very easy because I really believe in this um, quote, which I could not find the source for, which is making me wonder if it's just something someone said to me at a party that I liked one time, but scientific progress is limited only by the creativity of the science fiction writer. And essentially the essence of what this means is that, um, you know, anything is possible. And right now in engineering and all of the um, STEM sciences, there's been a, a wave of technological advances that are really making this more true than it's ever been. And in biology, that really is sort of comes through in this recent awarding of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry to Jennifer Didna and Emmanuel Carpenter, where um, they developed this um, sort of defense system for uh, microorganisms into a mechanism to edit DNA. And so there's this purple guide RNA where you can change the little sequence right here to target any strand of DNA in the whole universe, essentially, and then use this um, Cas9 protein that gets brought to the DNA based on where this purple guide binds and it damages the DNA and it can result in either a little deletion or you can um, do some tricks to insert whatever you want. So you can edit DNA in almost any organism on the planet right now um, because of this technology. And that's part of the reason that they won the Nobel Prize. Of course, people are thinking about this for medical and therapeutic purposes. But what I think it also means is that there's a whole range of biological questions that have not been able to be asked in the big three model systems. So, most work in biology has been done in fruit flies or these little nematode worms or invertebrate um, species. And, you know, they represent less than 10% of the biodiversity in the group that they belong to, which was called the bioteria, but they really are missing um, four fifths of the total animal phyla on the planet in terms of the different biology that's out there. And part of the reason that these systems were so powerful is because all of these genetic tools were available. And now with the advent of CRISPR, we as um, biologists and your students as the next generation of biologists can take their creative ideas into any one of these animal models to try to understand some aspect of biology that we did not know before. 
And I was sort of thinking about this a little bit when I got interested in this group of animals called the Cnidarians, and in particular the C anemone nematostella vectensis, which I'll talk to you a little bit about in a second. Um, so I got interested in nematostella. Here's the uh, bigger picture of the adult. I think they're incredibly beautiful. They're optically clear at all life stages. They have a mouth surrounded by tentacles at one end, and the other end is the aboral end, so they don't actually have a through gut or anything like that. Um, and I think what will become apparent is that they're really good for understanding the relationship between development and regeneration. This is a emerging question in developmental biology, which the typical model systems can't help us understand. But they also are sort of perfectly situated to help us understand how nervous systems evolve, in particular the brain and centralized nervous system. I want to pause from my science presentation and just say something for the teachers, I think this is actually a great animal to bring into your lab. Um, it's great for students. Normally in the wild, it's a burrowing anemone. They just burrow into the sediment. Um, and then they, the reason they're optically clear is they're ambush predators and they just sting whatever comes by. But their venom does not sting us. So it's not like a jellyfish that um, if you touch it, you get stung. In fact, there's companies now trying to use this for um, better delivery of lotions and things like that. But um, in our lab, in most labs, you can just keep them in these glass bowls and you can actually pack them at pretty high density. Gregory just happens to have be a particular anemone that one of the students in my lab fell in love with and so he gets his own bowl. But um, they're really easy to keep. You can just make instant ocean, you feed them brine shrimp whenever um, they need it and it's actually not that frequent if you're just using them, uh, not using them to spawn and get eggs. And it's ideal to keep them in a cool, dark place, but they actually don't care if you just leave them on a bench as long as the water doesn't evaporate. Um, and if you want animals to sort of watch development happen, since they, they spawn eggs and sperm externally, uh, you can just put them on a light box. You do have to think ahead if you want to do this because they have to get on the cycle for it. But, you know, any student with a simple dissecting microscope can watch these things develop in real time. Um, and you really don't even need to do that much husbandry. You can, if you're not really feeding them, you don't even need to change the water once a week. So they're really easy to keep in the lab. So if anybody's interested, please contact me and um, we can come up with plans for them. Okay, so before I get into the science, I also wanted to take a minute to tell you about um, my path to nematostella. And, you know, I think it's important to think when we're training STEM students, you know, how they got there. And I, like most um, people, had an interest in biology or whatever STEM technology was cool to me, cool to them at the time. And it started in high school. And I was actually convinced I was going to have a career in medicine. And in particular, I have been fascinated with the brain since I can remember. And, you know, I want to shout out to all of my mentors along the way. So I had three teachers, Larry, Bell, Jan, Bob, and Mitch Bakiel, who made um, and fostered this interest in the in biology. And I remember this was during O.J. Simpson when I was in high school. Mitch Bakiel created a crime scene with potatoes and I had to extract DNA from all these potatoes and do a forensic analysis to figure out if O.J. Potato was at the, the crime scene. It's just a very creative way to engage um, me and I think that's part of what we need to do as educators. Um, I went to the University of Rochester in the very first week of college. My life was changed forever when Fred Hagen took me into his lab where I did a lot of work in biochemistry and molecular biology research on enzymes that modify human proteins, particularly in our saliva and in the mucus of your nose, which is kind of gross, but it turns out really important for your survival. Um, and there I was really introduced to research and it was at that moment that I knew that medicine was no longer going to be my career. I was a first-generation college student, um, came from a pretty uh, poor background, and I didn't even know that if you were interested in biology, there were paths other than the medical fields available. And I think that's getting a lot better now, but it highlights how important it is to expose people to their potential um, directions in life. Don Kane got me really interested in developmental biology. Um, which is kind of what drove the rest of my career and actually a philosopher, um, Rich Feldman, shaped the way that I view and interact with the world and the way that I do and communicate my science. So I went from Rochester all the way across the country to Oregon. 
um, where I had two incredible mentors, Chris Doe and Judith Eisen, and they really taught me how to do genetics. So my background in biochemistry and molecular biology made me wanna go and understand um, how to use genetic approaches to solve problems in development. And I worked on fruit flies and zebrafish looking at how the nervous system develops. Um, as an undergrad, I actually, because of some coursework, got really fascinated by regeneration. Um, at one point, I thought I was going to have a company where I regenerated arms out of tissue on a wall and that I was going to help people that had, were amputees. It was a little creepy, but um, I had this idea and I saw a talk. So this is the star um, uh, from this guy, Mark Martindale, using the sea anemone nematostella to try to understand the origin of a number of traits that are specific to animals like us. And that whole field is essentially called evolution of development. And at Oregon, there were two professors, John Pulstowaite and Chuck Kimmel, who are big in this field, but specifically thinking about craniofacial evolution. So how do fishes and birds change the, change the shape of their structures in their face to fit whatever little environment they, they happen to want to exploit? And I realized that I could study regeneration and evolution of the nervous system uh, using the sea anemone and have my cake and eat it too. And it also helped because at the time, Mark's lab was in Hawaii. So I would be able to go to Hawaii and do my postdoc research was what I did and develop nematostella as a model system for um, neurogenesis, really pioneered this um, whole field of research and ultimately started my lab at Lehigh. Okay, taking longer than I wanted to, so sorry about that. All right, so I wanna give you a little vignette about how we look at how um, CNS has evolved using the sea anemone nematostella vectensis. This is um, a subset of bilaterian animals and they're the only animals on earth that have a centralized nervous system. And so they have a brain and a spinal cord. And the question has always been, is the central nervous system of a vertebrate, a mouse, the same as the central nervous system of a fly. In other words, did it evolve once before these animals split in evolution or did it evolve independently in each lineage? And one of the arguments that's been used to say that it evolved once is the anterior posterior patterning programs. So if you look at all of the animals that have central nervous systems in the bilaterians, and I know this is flipped, but don't worry about it, just worry about the colors, it turns out that there's a series of genes that are expressed, and this is kind of showing their relative domain, that are so conserved that you can sort of make this model of what the gene expression pattern is, and it essentially each um, part of the developing central nervous system has a code based on which genes it's expressed, and that they're in the same relative position. So sort of yellow, green, dark purple, and light purple are always the anterior um, part of the code and so forth. So this was used to argue that they came from a common um, ancestor, but the problem is no one had really looked to see if this really was conserved. So that's where nematostella and cnidarians come in. Cnidarians are sea anemones, corals, and jellyfish, and they don't have a centralized nervous system. They actually have a nerve net. And if we understand how this nerve net forms in these animals, it can give us a sense about how this ancestral nervous system was patterned, and we're pretty convinced that this was also a nerve net. In other words, if we look at the programs that we think are important for CNS development along the anterior posterior axis, and they were present in this ancestor, that tells us that they're not, um, it's not specific to CNSs, and it doesn't tell us they had a single origin. So what can we learn from studying the Malastella? You just need um, four little bits of background. The first is, this is the developmental series of nematostella. So this little juvenile polyp here, which is adorable, starts out as a fertilized egg. Um, it becomes essentially a ball of cells that rearranges so that the orange cells become the inside and the white cells become the outside of the ectoderm. And where the cells start to go in, um, actually becomes the mouth of the animal. So at these early stages, the basic body plan of this polyp is already present. And that's where the nervous system actually starts to form. 
So these genes, they don't matter what they are. Just know that every little purple dot is where the messenger RNA for each of these genes is expressed. And you can see that they're scattered in individual cells, which is consistent with the idea that the nerve net forms around the animal. And these genes also happen to tell us that the very earliest stages of neural development in sea anemones is exactly the same as the earliest stages of central nervous system development. So that's all well and good, but it doesn't really tell us how this nerve net is patterned. So that's what we're going to look at for the AP patterning to understand evolution. And to understand the data, we're going to turn genes off and turn genes on for this talk. And the way that we're going to turn genes off is by injecting a little molecule called a short hairpin RNA that targets a particular messenger RNA for degradation. So this is actually a video of a zebrafish embryo being injected, but it's the same thing that we do in the Matastella. And what you can see is if you target this gene 636 um, and you inject shRNA, the 636 expression goes away because you've targeted that mRNA for degradation, so you can't see purple messenger RNA because it's now gone. We can also make messenger RNA in a test tube and just direct, directly inject it into the egg. All of the cells inherit it and they um, will express the protein and we actually encode a fluorescent protein in tandem with, in this case, 636, so that we can visualize that the protein is actually made. So it's like a positive control. Um, so that's how we're going to manipulate the genes. And so now the question is, how does that anterior-posterior patterning occur in bilaterians that have a central nervous system and in nerve nets? There's a little molecule that gets made in the tail end of us um, and all animals related to us. And it's called Wnt, and it's just shown by this circle. And it diffuses from essentially our posterior all the way to our anterior such that um, when it binds to the receptors, the cells that are close to the source bind a lot of Wnt, and the cells that are really far bind a little bit of Wnt. And the cells use this gradient of Wnt activity to read out their relative position in the animal in, in something like a fish or a mouse that results in a head domain that's red, a trunk domain that's yellow and a tail domain that's blue. And the central nervous system reads out that information to essentially in determine which regions will express this particular code. Okay. Um, oops. It turns out that nematocella from the oral to the opposite side, the ab oral, uses this gradient of wind activity and it makes these domains that are the same color. And that those domains are um, stripes of gene expression and those stripes of gene expression are the homologs to the exact same genes that we see in central nervous system brain patterning. So that's very interesting. And more importantly, we can actually see that individual neuronal subtypes are born in um, stripes along the animal as well that roughly correspond to these domains. So this actually suggests that what we thought was significant to our brains was something that was already patterning nervous systems in the sea anemone. Okay, so this is interesting, but now we actually have to do some real science and test this model out. So it seems like tail, trunk, and head are the same mechanism in, in both whether you have a nerve net or a centralized nervous system, but are they really the same? We have to think a little bit about this. So you have two ideas. One is you actually have the gradient of wind activity establishing individual domains in the central nervous system, and then each domain makes its special type of neuron. The other possibility is that wind makes these domains along the animal, and that's just patterning the whole animal. And um, it actually, in a separate but similar pathway, gives rise to individual neurons um, along the length of the animal, but not, not um, that the domains are actually patterning the neurons. It's the gradient of wind activity doing both. This is what is believed to happen in the bilaterians that have centralized nervous systems. So we essentially competed these two models in our lab. And the strategy is that we're just gonna disrupt these domains and see um, what happens. 
uh, when you do that, um, we're going to knock down 636, this aboral marker. And when we do that, we actually don't see much of a change on the oral side of the animal. All the stuff that's in the trunk extends to the region that used to have 636. And the neurons that are born there are essentially gone. And this is the same phenotype that happens if you lose 636 in a mouse, you lose the forebrain. Um, if you inject messenger RNA so that 636 is everywhere, you lose the oral domain, you actually extend these neurons, which is a weird result. You lose the trunk domain marker, which is also a weird result. And you ultimately turn the entire C anemone embryo into um, the ab oral region. So it's, it would be basically like turning our entire brain and spinal cord into the forebrain. So it kind of looks like this model is true, but it turns out there's a problem with that. Um, unfortunately, and that is that um, when we did a bunch of other experiments to reinforce this model, all of them argue that this was actually happening in the metacell, and I don't really have time to go into them, but we realized that in the sea anemone, um, this gene right here, 636, also is what is used to help create this gradient of wind activity. So when we got rid of pink, we turn the whole animal into a block of wind. So we lost essentially the gradient. Um, so that's kind of shown here. This is what normally happens. Um, and when we lost 636, we lost the ability to block. Um, so we thought we could do something clever when we misexpressed 636. We turned everything into aboral, but we blocked wind everywhere. Um, but we could treat with this drug that the cells don't care how much wind they see. They, they turn on all the genes. They think that they're really high levels of wind. And um, essentially, this is just the data showing that. Um, so normally in wild type, you have your aboral domain. If you turn wind on everywhere, you lose 636. And so that's just evidence that this drug is doing what it's supposed to in nematostella. So we thought we'll just compete them against each other. And it's a very simple prediction. If our first hypothesis where wind makes domains that then make neurons is true, then we should see our aboral neurons everywhere. If the second hypothesis is true, then we should see no aboral neurons when we um, compete these two things against each other. And essentially what we see, here's the, the control. When we treat with the zinc and pallone, we lose aboral neurons. When we misexpress 636, we see these neurons everywhere. Um, and then when we compete them, we essentially get no expression of those aboral neurons, which really supports this model. So that's now looking like this is a more favored model, not the bilaterian central nervous system-like mechanism. And we don't have time to go over the data. In fact, we just got it this week, but now we really have good evidence that this model is actually the case in nematostella and not the CNS. So what does that tell us? It's kind of interesting because we now have a good idea that probably in the ancestral animal, there was something that more equivalent to this model going on and that really this um, linear pathway that we thought was specific to CNSs really did evolve within the group of animals that have a centralized nervous system. And it starts to favor again the idea that there really was a single origin of the CNS. Um, however, when we really went back through the literature, it's not clear to us that this has really been rigorously tested. And so we might actually need to go in and find some species within the bilaterians and then retest this model to, to confirm to us that that's the case. But it seems likely that um, the CNS really um, may have a single origin, at least based on anterior-posterior patterning. It's much more complex than that. So with the last um, like three minutes, I just want to talk about uh, other questions that are going on in our lab. Um, so I talked about being interested in comparing development and regeneration. So we've looked at how nervous system forms during development. So we, I just showed you data that was sort of looking at this in the context of understanding evolution, but it also tells us how the nervous system forms as the animal goes from egg to polyp. 
But these animals can also um, undergo asexual reproduction. So they get to a certain size and they just pinch off. And then this aboral rat remnant um, reforms a new polyp. We induce this by just cutting them in half. So we, we um, basically force regeneration to occur. And so what we've been doing is making transgenic lines that only label subsets of the nervous system. Um, and then we are cutting these animals and trying to understand how um, individual neuronal subtypes reform as the animal regenerates. And while we're doing that, we actually have deployed CRISPR-Cas9 in our lab to edit the genome. This is just a proof of principle. We took this neuronal gene NBASHA and we cut it out of the genome and we stuck in um, just a fluorescent protein that should turn on in every cell in the animal. And now that we know that we do, can do this, we're going to replace all of our neural genes with alleles that have um, genetic tricks that allow us to turn those genes on and off at will during development. So many of the genes that are deployed during regeneration also function in some way during development, even if they do something differently. So this will allow the animals to get to a point where we can cut them for regeneration and then we can switch that gene off genetically and ask if it's important or if its role functions um, the same or different during regeneration. We also stumbled across something very interesting. So um, engineers have been interested in thinking about how nervous systems scale. So as do you make a better processing nervous system by making more neurons or do you make more connections? And um, it turns out in animals we know that um, nervous systems can scale. So this is a planarian. If you starve it, it shrinks. If you feed it, it grows. Um, and its length um, uh, has an impact on um, okay. its length um, is correlated to uh, the number of neurons that it has. And in nematocella, we can actually use our transgenics to ask the same question. So longitudinal neurons, which are shown in these stripes here, and tripolar neurons are scattered along the oral to aboral axis of the animal. And it turns out that nematostella, when you starve it, it shrinks. And when you feed it, it grows. And those, num those neurons actually scale. And in planarians, they can't really follow this in real time because those animals can't you can't make transgenic animals to actually visualize the neurons in the, the animal as it's growing and shrinking. And we've realized that we can now do that in nematocella, so we can use all those tools for regeneration to try to understand the mechanisms that control nervous system scaling. Um, so that's kind of just an overview of the things that go, in, go on in my lab and a little vignette of how we use the system to understand evolution. I understand that it was uh, sort of a rapid fire um, and skipped a lot of the details, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what we do. And I wanna thank all of the people in my lab that do this, especially Dylan Faltine Gonzalez, who did all the work I showed, a number of undergrads, collaborators, and of course, funding sources. And if any of you guys have questions, and you shouldn't drink coffee in the afternoon before a presentation. <laughs> I think we're with you there. Thank you so much. That was incredible. And um, we have had some um, comments from teachers, uh, private comments, uh, that this is a very interesting presentation. And, um, and I say, Kim, and I must agree. Um, I do have some questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, and the first would be, uh, if someone, a teacher, for example, did want to work with Nematostella in their classroom, where would they obtain them? So you can get them in a number of places right now. So um, one, you can email our lab. We are in a little bit of a crunch for animals because we have so many people in the lab right now, but you can also buy them very cheaply from Woods Hole in the Marine Biological Lab um, at, in Woods Hole, Massachusetts is collecting them and selling them. If you're adventurous, there's online video resources to go and actually get anemones. They're endemic to the northeast coast of the United States from Nova Scotia, Canada to um, Georgia. And they've recently been found in Florida. They're everywhere in the globe now because of shipping and ballast water. Um, but the, 
but yeah, they're, they're pretty easy to get. We could send a few if you were, if someone knew they were going to use them in like a year or two, because it's easy to expand them once you have them. You just cut them and get more animals. <laughs> so, so what we may do then is um, when we reach out to you uh, following the presentation is um, just ask for those um, name sources again and then distribute them to our educators uh, mm -hmm. following the presentation. Yep. Um, also, uh, I see uh, that Molly Levine has asked, could you just uh, mention again the name of the program um, that uh, involves the uh, scholarship to Lehigh? Um, so the, the program is called RARE. It's um, Rapid Accelerated Research Experience. And it's, it's not a biology program, it's a STEM program. So it covers the College of Engineering, um, and if people are really interested in that, I can um, talk to the people that run it. And when I send you guys materials, I will send more information on that as well. Okay. So, um, If you did intend to apply this research to either neural or physical applications, where would you start in terms of what are the priorities in the human system? Um, and then I'll save the second one for after you answer. <laughs> okay, so um, the it's kind of there's a long answer to that because I've skipped a lot of data that we have in the lab, and what I think actually is happening is that in nematostella, as it grows and shrinks, the nervous system has what I'm terming as fractal units of um, sensory information, processing that information, and then coordinating some sort of global output for whatever it is. If it's touch of a fish that's trying to bite you, you want to scrunch up. If it's prey, you want to stab it and eat it. Um, and so what I think is going on is that um, whole fractal circuits are being inserted and removed from the nervous system simultaneously. Mm. And even though these animals, and actually the same thing happens with us as we grow and shrink, our, strep, our touch receptors sort of grow more dendrites on the side of our body. So as your skin expands, they expand to cover that area. Um, and, but at the end of the day, we have a central processing center where you don't really grow or shrink neurons too much, but you process that information. And even though cnidarians have a nerve net, there's actually good and good data from behavioral studies that suggest that they have a central processing. And so I think all those fractal things that are growing and shrinking are somehow going to a processing place where the neurons aren't changing. And so my my question is, can we map all those circuits and show them changing as the animal grows and shrinks and that's a long ways down the road you're still pursuing <laughs> yeah the data that i showed you is actually only like a couple of months old okay what that's amazing um I, this kind of leads into the second half of that question which was um uh in terms of splicing uh planaria for example mm -hmm. um in order to to induce regeneration mm -hmm. um how does that affect the scale of the neural system in terms of uh, do the neurons still respond to that splicing? Do they decrease? Do they increase? So the, in planarians, all of the data has to be done in fixed animals. And so it's all um, collab, uh, corollary evidence that the nervous system scales. And um, that was one of the reasons that we actually got so excited about our results because it's the first time that anybody's been able to actually demonstrate that that happens because we can track those neurons within an individual animal as it's growing and shrinking. So we, when we do these experiments, we separate out everybody into their, their own well and then that animal becomes our, its own identity for a couple of months. In planarians, they just fix them because they can't follow anything in real time in vivo. And so we don't know, and we're sort of hoping that nematocella can help us get to some of those questions or the biology of what's significant about that. And um, another question from an educator um, from uh, Molly, again, uh, 
do you have um, students, um, graduate students, or uh, folks from your lab who could perhaps um, either come into high schools or perhaps speak virtually? Um, you know, obviously, you know, COVID is an issue right now, but do you have are you aware of anyone who would be willing to, in the Pennsylvania area, um, visit some high schools? Um, I can ask them in general. My group is pretty open to those types of events. And um, in the past, I've had students do the DNA day. So they're, they're pretty plugged in to those, to sort of outreach. Um, my guess is the answer is yes, but I'm not gonna commit them to that without right. asking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, two more quick ones, and then uh, I'll, I'll let you wrap this up. Um, uh, are you researching or conducting experiments to see how all the nerve systems relate between the animals from micro to macro? Um, I'm not sure if I um, understand the question in... I, I, think, I think the question is trying to um, ask if you can make any um, deductions on how your work would translate to the animal kingdom as a whole. Hmm. So, um, I definitely think that the work in what's been done in Nidarians in general, not just nematostella and in Bilaterians, it's very clear that their common ancestor had a nerve net nervous system that somehow evolved into all the nervous systems in the Nidarians and all the nervous systems in the Bilaterians. And so we are trying to understand how they relate. Um, what's weird about this is there's another group of animals, um, and I'm just, can you guys see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, so this group of animals down here, the comb jellies, the tenophore, they're the only other group that has mm. a nervous system. So these guys do, and these tenophores. And right now, there's, I think, not clear evidence, but there's emerging evidence that their nervous system is completely independently derived. And so it evolved a whole nervous system that is not related to the nervous systems in these animals at all. And I think that that is kind of mind blowing because we think that the nervous system is such a special trait in animals and it would be so hard to evolve it that it would have had to evolve once. And the data is really starting to suggest that that is a, um, an overly biased humanistic interpretation of what nature is powerful enough to do. Um, and that, um, but there could be multiple uh, nervous system evolutions within the animals, which I think is so cool. Um, I think the last question would probably exceed our time. So I may just ask you to respond to this when we contact you, um, but I'll speak it so you can ponder on it. Um, you did mention uh, that this research is very new, um, but there is some curiosity about expanding on the lost gradient in terms of the WENT molecules mm -hmm. and how removing, you said the pink section, um, how you're essentially turning the, the fish into the blob, so, so to speak. <laughs> so um, we'll include that when we reach out to you and, and maybe uh, if you're able, you can provide some insight. Um, otherwise, uh, I, it, if you have any further comments, please go ahead and otherwise i would like to thank you so very much for presenting this incredibly engaging uh information yeah well, um no other further comments except for uh one of the things i like about developmental biology is that as a whole the society has recognized that underrepresented groups in women have made incredible contributions to the field and they were not recognized for those contributions because of sort of the climate at the time and they're going back and actually renaming things in textbooks and um, giving credit where credit is due. And I think that one of the problems with incorporating underrepresented groups in STEM is as you look up the ladder, you just see a bunch of people that look like me, which is just a typical basic white guy. And it's important to start showing people that everybody has been contributing to the science and start making sure students are aware when they're young 
so that they realize that it is a place for them and that they do belong. And I feel very strongly about that. It's wonderful to hear that from you, from a professor, um, from someone who is a basic white guy. Um, <laughs> so um, I know I've had many a conversation with students myself in the past um, about that same question. And so I'm glad to hear it um, coming from a professor as well. And I'm certain that our teachers would share that sentiment. Um, so thank you very much. And um, I appreciate your time.